and I will sing. What a declaration, what a proclamation that we are saying, I will sing before a breakthrough happens. We're proclaiming that Jesus is the answer, the breakthrough coming, but we're also declaring for ourselves to rely on Jesus, not on ourselves, but trusting in him, placing our faith in him. Jesus, we thank you that you are our answer, that we look to you for breakthrough. We don't trust in our own merits, but we trust in the work that you have already done on the cross. And we hold tight to the promise knowing that you will once again return and to retrieve your bride. So we declare and we proclaim and we sing loud before the breakthrough will happen. Lord, be with us this morning. Spirit, speak to us, I pray, as we dive into your word. In your name, amen. Welcome, good morning. Thanks for joining us online again. Uh, I love when we engage in conversation rather than me just speaking to you uh, and a little bit difficult in a setting like this. So again, please use the chat down below. We'd love to engage with you in the chat uh, during the service. Hit the, hit the heart button as well. It's a great way that we can as a community just engage as we read God's word together. We're on our second week of our three-part series, Theology of the Table, and I'm going to jump right into it this morning. Okay, we've been talking about this theme of food. We've been talking about the concept of this dinner table, and Luke uses uh, often this picture of food and this theme of a table to bring about instruction and teaching in his gospel. There's emphasis on eating and drinking. Food is more than just a physical component. It is a spiritual connection. Uh, and in Luke's gospel, Jesus is often either talking about eating or he is eating with people. Uh, and it's, you know, no reason, no wonder why Jesus was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Now, he wasn't, and he often hung out with those with the reputations of being gluttons and drunkards. Uh, but there's, there's something about where Luke teaches through this theme of a table and this theme of food. And some of the most important teachings of Jesus comes on these settings of a table and food. He often uh, ate with sinners and outcasts, but there's one specific story where Jesus eats with a prominent Pharisee, a religious leader. And we're gonna look into that story this morning. I have titled my message this morning, Table Manners, Character at the Table. And our scripture this morning is Luke chapter 14, verses 1 to 24. Now, we're going to read through a large section. These are 24 verses that we're going to go through together. So I encourage you to, to have your Bibles open and to have a journal with you if you write down, or maybe it's your phone, whatever it may be, uh, and to follow along. We're going to go through a narrative style of uh, preaching this morning as we go through this story together. So hopefully you have your cup of coffee with you or your cup of tea. I know some people, they were eating breakfast while watching the sermon last week, which kind of is fitting as we're talking about food. And so whatever it may be, join in, keep your Bibles open as we read God's word together. Luke 14 says this. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house with a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you into a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, 
the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who have been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. They first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So we're going to go through this, this story, kind of a narrative here. What a wonderful story that, that Luke wrote. And in any good story, there's a preface, right? A, pre a preface that is the introduction of the book. It's stating its subjects, its scope. And so here's this dinner party happening on a Saturday night, a Saturday evening. It's the Sabbath. Jesus is invited to this quite prominent religious leader. So as a prominent Pharisee, as Luke writes. And these Pharisees, they're some of the most zealous, right, of law keepers among all of the Jews. And Luke mentions that, that Jesus is being carefully watched by all of those. So you can get the scene a little bit, right? Jesus is being carefully watched by this prominent leader and all his other guests that are around. And so the tension in the area is pretty high. Now, I don't think they're inside the house just yet because Luke talks about that there was this man that Jesus noticed who was ill, had this physical swelling, dropsy. Uh, and so they're most likely outside of his house, probably outside of his property. Uh, and Jesus poses this question. And he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Of, of course, these, these leaders know the answer, that they are to withhold of any activity on the Sabbath and to fully rest, to remember God and his creation of the world and of mankind and to celebrate his goodness, his presence, and his people. And so we're to, to rest of all activity, including healing. And so they actually don't say anything. It's somewhat like a I remember back in the youth group days where I'd pose a question and nobody would answer it because they're afraid that they're going to answer it wrong, so they say nothing. This is what these religious leaders and teachers do. They, they don't say anything. Jesus then reaches out, grabs the man, and heals him. This miraculous healing taking place prior to this dinner on a Sabbath with a bunch of religious leaders. Tension is high already in this scene. Then he asks another question. He says, what if your son or an ox were to fall into a well? Would you not retrieve and pick up your son or your ox? And again, there's no response. See, what's interesting is the first question was about principle. The second one was personal. And when we look at, at the law, we look at scripture, man, sometimes it's easy to say, no, this is the rule of thumb and we have to abide by it. But when it's personal, there becomes a little bit of a, of a twist to it. When there's relationship involved, man, it's emotional and it's harder. And so the first one he asks about principle. The second is personal. And yet again, there's silence and the Pharisees say nothing. I wish I could have been there in the opening scene of this story that Luke writes here. There's, there's high tension. Jesus is being watched very carefully. These, these leaders are looking at him. He performs a healing. He asks these questions, knowing that he's kind of prodding a little bit and poking the bear. And they had nothing to say. Next up is the plot. So the plot is, is that they're in the house and there's this dinner party, this dinner on the Sabbath. And it's customary to have uh, the table set and there is the host's seating, a place of honor. And then there's also on the other end of the table, this honor for a guest to sit at. And it was very normal in the culture uh, at that time in first century Palestine to, 
When you get into a place like that, you want to sit closest to the host or you want to sit closest to this guest of honor. And so not only is Jesus being watched by all those that are in the room, in, in verse 7, Luke states that, he, that Jesus himself has taken inventory of all those in the room. He says he noticed how the guests picked the place of honor at the table. So yes, Jesus is being watched. Everyone is, is watching the one, but the one is watching everyone else. He's taken inventory, and he's noticed how the guests find their seat. Maybe type in the chat the word how. I want you to remember that. Say it to the person on the couch beside you. How. Luke often talks about the how, not just the what. How they picked their place at the table. Jockeying for position of influence and of power, being closest to the guest of honor. See, there was this major societal and status gap in first century Palestine. This gap of wealthy and poor, this gap of men and women and children, this gap of those who were educated and those who were not, this gap of, of those who were healthy and sick, where you were born, the town, the location, there was quite a bit of racism. And so what took place, this cultural norm, there was these varying levels of status based on your health, your sickness, your finances, your place of birth. And, and it became where a person was then valued, deemed something of worth, and it became their identity. And it's seen in this dinner party as well. This prominent Pharisee holding a, a dinner on the Sabbath for his friends and for his relatives and for his neighbors that are near them in his inner circle of influence. Wealth at the table education at the table, religion at the table, but also arrogance at the table and pride at the table. See, the lame and the sick, they were just outside. The man was just outside the house. Probably would not have been noticed if it weren't for Jesus noticing the individual and healing him. And so Jesus, he, he assesses the room and he sees all those that are there jockeying for position at the table trying to find this place of honor or closest to it, wanting to be important. You know, whether it's at the expense of the person outside or, or making sure everybody else in the room is at a lower place than where they sit, they're jockeying for position. And so Jesus, he gives a talk about table manners. To all those in the room, he speaks up and he gives this talk about character. And he says, when you're invited to a meal, be wise on where you sit and who you sit with. Don't seek this place of high honor because you may be embarrassed. Start at the lowest spot as you may be exalted. See, there's this picture of food. There's this picture of a table setting. But there is a deeper spiritual teaching to what Luke is conveying in his gospel. I mentioned last week that Luke's gospel, uh, it was one of of prophetic hope for people as they read. Like his audience, they were, the, they were the people who were outside the doors, right? They are the man who is sick and outside the property. Luke wrote to those who were the lame and the poor and the sick and the outcast. And some scholars claim that Luke's account of Jesus is really the gospel to the Gentiles, those outside of God's chosen people, the Israelites. And what Jesus does in this scene is is he flips the script. That's who he is. That's what he does. He, he always flips the script on so many situations and scenes. When you think you've got it all together, when you think you've got it figured out and you're okay, Jesus then comes in and says, hold on, wait one minute. I want to talk to you and to teach you about some manners here. I want to teach you about some character. I want to teach you about humility. See, these men and women in this room at this table, they were, they were thinking they were in a place of, of leadership and of influence, that they've made it, that they're good now, this prominence and status. Yet there's people just outside the door who are sick and who are without food and who are in need of help and care, but they're neglected completely. And he says, if you sit at the place of honor, you will be humiliated. But if you sit at the lowest place, you will be honored. See how he, he flips it, right? And Jesus in this story here, 
Yes, he's using a physical posture of sitting at a table, but there's a deeper spiritual teaching to it. The, the teaching that posture of pride leads to humiliation, and the posture of humility leads to honor. Luke uses the physical posture that Jesus is teaching to convey a deep spiritual truth of a posture of humility. Like I said, he always takes the chance to, to flip the script, right? Jesus loved to teach that way and a bit of a shock value to the norm, the cultural norms at the time. Maybe right into the chat if you know the answer to this. If you want to be first, you must be, write it down. If you want to be first, you must be last. Another one, to find life, you must what? Type it in the chat. To find life, you must lose it. And he says in verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we've got the preface, we've got the plot and the scene setting here, but then there's this pivot. There's this pivot in the story. And uh, man, I would love to be in the room at this time. Okay, I think of like a movie scene. I think of this build up. Often there's this, this slow build of music and intensity, right? And then all of a sudden there's this moment, this pivot. And I imagine here, same thing, this build up. And then all of a sudden silence and Jesus, he pivots and he looks towards the host. And he says, and you, you think you're so generous. You think you're so giving. Having this meal with your, your relatives and your family and your rich neighbors. You're not truly giving. You don't really truly have a, have a righteous generosity about you because you know you're going to be repaid. And I think, oh man, this scene, how awkward it would have been to sit at that table. Uh, we in our home, we, we sit around our dinner table and my son Seth, He's five. We have two boys, Seth and Simeon, five and three. I just want to give a shout out to my boys. I love you too. You guys are growing up to be such good boys. I'm so proud of you. But one of Seth's favorite things to say right now is, oh, that's awkward. He says it at the dinner table. We may be out in the front riding bikes. Uh, we may be in the backyard. Whatever the situation may be, he loves to say this line, oh, that's awkward. And for the most time like it's not actually awkward he just thinks it's humorous and so he says the words oh that's awkward and we live right now in a culture and society that thinks awkward is hilarious the show the tv show the office right it's not even running anymore but yet it's still so popular that people watch it over and over again because it's funny and awkward humor is hilarious now my wife Rebecca, she can't handle that show because it's so awkward it makes her like squirmy and like cringe in the chair as she's watching it. Now th this is the kind of awkward that's taking place in this story. It is cringeworthy. It is not funny. <laughs> it is not humorous. It is so awkward. Like imagine this scene, right? Jesus is being watched. He's prodded a little bit to these religious leaders and teachers. He's healed somebody on the Sabbath, which is a no-no to them. He sees them jockeying for position of influence and prom prominence. And then he gives this teaching, and then out of nowhere, he pivots and he points to the host. And he says, and you. And everybody is there watching. And he calls out the host. And he's like, and you think you're so righteous. You think you're so generous. See, true generosity isn't giving when there's a return. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's called quid pro quo, right? I got this one, you get the next one. That's not generosity. That's a tab. That's a loan, like where we owe someone back. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He says true generosity is expecting nothing in return. This man, this prominent leader, this religious leader, this example in the society and community, and he only gave so that he would gain. He was not self-giving. He was self-gaining. This was his leadership. This was how he walked. This was his aura about him. And Jesus calls him out in front of his entire guest crew. 
And it's not that we can't invite our friends, it's not that we can't invite our family, but we cannot do it at the neglect of those in need. That's what Jesus' teaching is here. He says, when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. I love that. A picture of hope to the outcasts, right? Now this word blessed, in verse 15, there's a man who talks about what it is to be blessed. He's sitting at the table. I don't know if he leaned over to Jesus or not, or if he spoke across the table, whatever it may be. He speaks to Jesus, and he said, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now remember, Luke doesn't focus on just what is said, but what was the word I got you to type in earlier? He focuses on how things are said. How is huge in this story. Because this man, as he speaks to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. That's not an incorrect statement. It's to eat in the feast of the kingdom of God, to spend eternity with the Lord, anyone and everyone who will be there will be blessed. But that's not how this quote is received. That's not how it was, it was spoken, and it wasn't how it was received. This truth actually became a false statement because the, the man who spoke of this in verse 15, where he's quoted here, he, he spoke from this vantage point of pride and of arrogance that he's made it, right? I am here because of who I am and what I've done. I've earned my spot, and because I've done so, I'm a blessed man. Anyone who sits here is blessed. That's the aura in which that he gives off as he spoke this line. And Jesus says, no. No, it's not because of who you are and because of what you've done. Rather, it's in spite of who you are and because of what the Lord has done that you have a seat at this table. This man and the, and the others that were in this room, they were more concerned for their own position at the table than how many they could get to the table. They were more concerned about their place and, and jockeying for position than trying to get as many people to the table as possible. And first of all, I want to reach out and I want to encourage and I want to give aid in the sense that we need to be careful in teaching like this. We need to be careful about false teaching. Scripture is very clear. There's lots of it about being very careful about false teaching. Where it sounds biblical, but it is not. It, it sounds heartfelt, but it's filled with inner hate. And as a church, we need to be careful to those who use God's word for personal gain instead of exemplifying sacrificial love, where they're jockeying for positions of influence and positions of power and leadership, where their voice and their platform is their central focus of their ministry, where accountability is disregarded altogether. We need to be careful collectively as a church. We need to watch out. We need to stand up and we need to stand together as well, personally, as followers of Jesus, we need to, to read and study Scripture regularly, to feed regularly on God's Word. Jesus said the words, man does not live on bread alone, but on the very Word of God. To have vibrant, healthy, spiritual lives is to protect oneself from false, corrupt teaching. Because false teaching, it sounds good. Like it sounds whimsical and it sounds loving and it emotionally comes across as it, it does make sense. And I, I like that. They use their words wisely, right? Blessed is the one who eats at the feast in the kingdom of God. That sounds true. But when it's done so with pride, when it's done so with this inner arrogance, when it's done so on the platform for self-gaining rather than self-giving, it is false. It's self-serving and not self-sacrificial. And this is how this man spoke. This shows of his character. He spoke of a spiritual truth with a false character. He cared more about his personal gain than he did of, of getting people to the table. And Jesus is saying this, that we are not only blessed when we are given a seat at the table, that we are blessed when we give up our seat at the table. How we treat other people matters. By putting others above ourselves, 
by considering others of value and worth that are different than us, that may seem uh, maybe as an outcast of society, maybe not in our normal groupings in which that we would hang out with, but to think of them as a child of God, to think of them as, as someone of great value, of great worth, no matter their history or their background. And to use scripture in a way of personal gain, we need to watch out for ourselves and for those who are in leadership above us. So there's this preface, there's this plot, there's this pivot that Jesus speaks to the host, and then Jesus finishes off this section with a parable. And in this parable, there's a man, and he has this banquet, and he has this guest list, and he sends out the invites to all those guests he's invited. And it comes time to this, this meal, this banquet to have. And all those who were invited began to make these excuses, to not show up for th these odd reasons, right? And the master became quite angry and, and frustrated the fact that these guests did not show up. So he sent his servant out uh, and to find the poor, to find the maimed, to find the lame and the blind, the social outcasts. Okay, remember, Luke's gospel, right? Who it's written to, who the audience is, who's going to be reading this when he first wrote it. And it was those social outcasts, those who were outside the people of God, who felt they never were given a seat at the table to begin with. So this is hope for his readers, that they too can be invited in to this banquet, in to this feast. There's still room. There's still room, the servant says. So the master says, go out a second time. Go out further. Go out past the walls. Go out to that we would never think of, the roads and the country lanes, and compel them to come in. Now, Jesus never gave an explanation of this parable, but I think it's safe to say that the host is, is the Father, is God, and that this banquet is eternity in his presence. And the people who were first invited, those original guests that had the invite to the, to the feast, would be the chosen people of God, to what we now know as, as the people of Israel, the Jews, right? God's chosen nation. Paul says in the book of Romans, right, that God has extended salvation to all mankind, first to the Jews and then to the Greeks, Gentiles. All those non-Jews are Gentiles. So first to the Jews, then to the Greeks. Paul also says in Timothy, as he speaks to Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy 2, God, who wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. So God wants all to be saved and come to him. Now, first, there is the Jews who had the original invite. But then the servant goes out to all mankind, to anyone and everyone that he can find. That's the gospel message, that it, it is to everyone and anyone to have that people are not looked over, that they're not disregarded. They have been, maybe have been treated that way by the Jews, but that the Lord wants them there at the table as well. And it's sad that, that many will not accept this invitation. It is, it's, it's sad that they choose other means, other reasons than to attend this banquet feast, ultimately to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord. And these excuses that were given, one had bought a piece of ground and he said he must go see it. Another had bought five oxen, five yoke of oxen and wanted to test them out. And it, another one was a couple who was recently married. And at first they seem like noble reasons, right? Employment responsibility, property responsibility, uh, family responsibility. They seem noble at first, but in all honesty, they're laughable. Like, they're lame excuses if you look deeply into as to why they were given, right? The first one, who had bought ground and said that he must go see it. Like, who purchases land without first going to see it? That's like today saying that we're going to purchase a home and have, like, not go to it at all, not get it checked out or anything like that. We're just going to purchase it, but then I have to go check it out afterwards. 
the auction, right? That's like a business owner saying, okay, I need to go buy this fleet of vehicles, but I'm not going to check out any of it first. I'm just going to purchase it and then I'm going to go look at it. Like no one would do that. No one in their right mind would make that decision. And the married couple, the, the young newly married couple, uh, we don't have the time to go, which I think is hilarious. This is where I think it's laughable because married couples without any kids, they have the most time in the world out of any other time in their lives as an adult. They have the most time in the world. And we have friends, married couples who are without kids. So if you're watching this, I'm going to make fun of you. Often when we hang out with, with couples and there's some who have kids and those who don't, the first people to leave the dinner party or the hangout is the couple with no kids. They're always the first to leave for whatever reason. And those with kids were like, what do they have to leave for? They got nothing for the reason in which that they need to leave. For all of us who are like socially deprived because all we're doing is hanging out with our kids all day, we want it so bad. But they're laughable excuses, they're lame. But ultimately, they were just unwilling. They were unwilling to do what Levi did, to get up, to drop everything, and to follow Jesus, and to sit at the table with the Lord in eternity forever. They did the opposite of what Levi did. Get up, drop everything, follow Jesus, and sit at the table. Instead, they just made excuses. So what excuses do we make? Maybe not in regards to eternity, but in regards to devotions. Man, we make excuses all the time as to why we don't sit and feast with the Lord in our daily devotions. All the time. And the danger is allowing the affairs of life to keep us from accepting the things of eternity to allow the things of our day-to-day -to, -day to get into the way of eternity is a dangerous place to be. See, this picture of a table, of this dinner party, it's more than just a Sabbath dinner. It's more than just a Saturday night dinner party. It's a teaching about character. It's a teaching about humility. It's a teaching about accepting others, of thinking others above ourselves. It's a teaching about love. It's a teaching about self-giving, not self-gaining. These, the, these are the attributes, I believe, as a, as a Christ follower, that we are to exemplify, that we are to live out. These are the table manners of a Christian. To be humble, patient, kind, and good, faithful, and gentle, and self-controlled. These are the attributes that, that as Christ followers, we are to have and to live out and to be led by are these attributes. See, the goal in character development as a follower of Christ is not to become a better version of us. It's to become a less version of us. It's to exalt Jesus in front of us, to proclaim him as the answer and author of our faith. I just want to conclude with this. At Summit Pacific College, I'm the campus pastor there, and I have the opportunity to pastor future pastors. And we teach doctrine, and we teach theology, and, and we talk about leadership, and we practice these things. And as the, as the pastor directing a lot of their spiritual walks and walking with them and serving them, we talk just as much about character as we do theology and doctrine. And it is just as important as having proper doctrine and theology is to have proper character. Because without it, your doctrine and theology mean nothing. Nothing. And there's this one letter in the New Testament, Titus, Paul writes to this young pastor. So I've used this passage and I use this book often with our students. And Titus, he is this pastor of a small network of home churches that he gives leadership and oversight to. And the, the letter written to Titus, the book of Titus, it's about producing right living while paying careful attention to theological truths. And Paul writes this to Titus, and he says in Titus 2, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, 
dignity and sound speech so that you cannot be condemned, that others have nothing evil to say. This may be a story about Jesus having a dinner party with a bunch of religious leaders, but there's something so much deeper to this passage. This theme of, of food, this theme of a table and a banquet is less about the actual food and table and more about character, more about humility, more about loving and accepting others and about right living. How we treat people matters. How we care for people matters. Those that we may pass over quickly. God asks us, he calls us, he commands us to take care of them. And as we continue on in our, our series, Theology of the Table, as we continue to read through the book of Luke, my hope and my prayer is that the Spirit will speak to you about your character, about your humility, that he would speak and intercede to you on a spiritual level. May I pray for you? Lord, we thank you for your example of leadership. We thank you for your example of humility and of character, how you conducted yourself. When you were treated poorly, how you responded with love. When you saw injustice, how you responded with love. Thank you for your example of sacrificial love, not self-serving love. What a wonderful savior, what a wonderful leader you are. Spirit, would you convict our hearts as we live out and as we lead those that are around us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are close, that you are near, and that you are at work. We pray this in your name. Amen.